Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. My family wants to see it. <laughs> All right, very good. Well, welcome tonight. Um, I just wanted to get, let you guys know that the museum is lit completely by candles and oil lamps. And so the interior of the building is very dim. Um, please let your eyes become accustomed to the dimness before we get started. So as we walk in, you know, let your eyes settle a little bit. And um, we have tried our best to make as many areas of the museum as lit as possible, but sometimes some areas may still seem a little dim, so please do watch your step. I ask that the last person in shuts the door behind them, both of them. All right. lights, people jumping out at you and trying to startle you. Is that really scary? Yeah, it's startling. You know, you're, you're scared for a short period of time, but you leave knowing that no one's there is going to hurt you and that it was a fun memory. This is a lot different. This is very real. Not only is this an exploration of some of our most bizarre customs, but it is being done in an environment that is steeped in local history. I want you to stand still for a moment during a tour and look listen, feel, and know that if someone wants to touch you in this place, they will. That being said, this is a paranormally active building. Um, I'm, we only have time for just a couple of, of stories before we get on our tour. Um, but the first story that I'm going to tell you relates to this picture here of Emma Coleman. I would, I'm the curator of the building and I have occasion to be in here many hours alone. And I also have spent many night hours alone in here. One time while going through um, pictures, I came across this picture here in the back closet and thought it was too beautiful to sit in a closet. So I hung it up and proceeded to look for the information. Went months without finding it. One day I was here waiting for a friend to come and join me and I had brought up a two liter bottle of soda and a stack of plastic cups. I set them on my desk behind a pile of books about this tall and proceeded to get to work. I was in the other room when I heard something fall and roll on the ground. I went back into the office to, dis to discover that the plastic cups had jumped over that pile of books and was laying on the floor rolling in a circle. Now, none of the windows in this house open. They are all sealed shut for security purposes. So there was no breeze at all that day. I went back to work and I discovered at the very bottom of the pile of books I was working on, there was a card, a description card that said, hand-drawn charcoal pencil portrait of Emma Coleman. So I finally had a name for this poor girl. Um, many people have come up to me through the years and told me that they've seen the image of a young woman dressed in white with brown hair sitting on the bed. Um, I mentioned to them, oh, a mannequin. And they say, mannequins don't move. So we've decided to give the spirit that is present in this building the name of Emma simply because no one wants to be called it. And it kind of gives it a little bit more of, of a peaceful presence to be able to put a name to something. The last story that I will leave you with before we get started, amongst many other stories, is one that was re related to me recently. A gentleman that used to live in town um, was walking his dogs past the museum at about 11 o'clock at night in April, this past April. And he noticed that there were two little girls looking through the window. So he, he let me know that uh, I think it's really strange that your little girls are were playing up there in the museum at 11 o'clock at night. We don't come up here that late at night, and we certainly don't come up here in the dark. And so I said to him, mannequins? He said the same thing, but I have been remarked too many times, mannequins don't move. So to set the, to set the tone for your, the rest of your tour here tonight, um, I will tell you though that our house is in mourning. There has been the death of a loved one. And so the grieving family wishes you to keep your voices down and to not interact with them during their grieving process. 
So if you will just follow me, we will go into the next stage of your tour. Are there jump scares? No? 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 I of the wake of Mr. Jacob Smithers. He died suddenly while on a business trip to Chicago. His body was brought home, home on a train in a transportation coffin. Now, he was a tall man of about six foot three inches and would not fit into this standard sized coffin. Therefore, at least six inches needed to be removed from his body in order to make him fit. The remainder they placed along the inside foot area of the coffin and draped it with a shroud so that his family would not be horrified by the sight. Once he arrived home, his family has never left his side. They have attended him around the clock, keeping awake out of respect. All of the clocks in the house were stopped at the moment of his death, and all of the mirrors have been covered to prevent his spirit from being becoming lured in and trapped there. The pictures of his deceased family members have been draped in black, and the pictures of his living family members have been turned face down on the tables to prevent any of them from being possessed by his displaced spirit. Tomorrow, when his body is to be taken to his funeral, he will be removed from the house feet first so that he cannot beckon his loved ones to follow him to the grave. Once at the cemetery, his body will be removed from this temporary coffin and he will be interred into his final resting place within the family plot. Now, if you guys will space yourself out so that you can see into the solarium for this next part of our tour. mid-1800s, a movement known as the Spiritualist Movement gained in popularity. The Spiritualists believed that the dead could be contacted after death. It soon became the fashion of the time to hold parties centered around seances for the purpose of contacting dead loved ones. As you girls know, I'm a gifted medium, and we are here today to speak with my dearly departed brother, so let us please join hands. Mr. Jacob Smithers, it is your much-bereaved sister Sarah and your nieces here to speak with you. 
So please, dear brother, could you enter the house and make your presence known? Thank you. Wonderful. Please come closer into this room. That means it's really him. Thank you for joining us, Jacob. Your poor wife is nearly sick with grief, and now the bank wants to take the house. But she keeps insisting you hid a large sum of money here somewhere. So please answer my questions by knocking once for yes or twice for no. Do you have money hidden in this house? Is it on this main floor of the house? Is it upstairs? Is it in the cellar? Is it enough money for your wife to save the house? Wonderful. Thank you so much, dear brother, for everything. We love you and we bid you farewell. Now, if you will follow me, we're going to go back through this door here. And we're going to go straight ahead into the next room. It will be the kitchen. that plague their ancestors. To name a few, cholera, smallpox, yellow fever, and diphtheria. Treatments, early treatments of these diseases were passed down from generation to generation. And oftentimes, these remedies would only treat the symptoms and not the actual disease. Advancements in medicine and sanitation and in our understanding of how diseases are passed from person to person have all but wiped out these horrible diseases from our society. It really is a wonder, though, that any of us are still here today. You mentioned diphtheria. My granddaughter, Maggie, has lost all of her brothers and sisters to diphtheria. All 10 of them. Just in the last couple of years. And now Maggie has the death rattle. She's upstairs fighting for her life right now. Dr. Brown did what he could. He swapped her throat with um, alcohol on, on, a, on a sponge. Oh, my, that's what they're doing these days. Um, it didn't seem to be doing much more. So I'm making a mustard plaster, and this is a strong one. Aren't you worried about it burning your skin? Well, normally it would be seven parts flour to one part dry mustard. Because it's of the blistering, you yeah. know? Yeah. But she's in such bad shape that I'm going to use three parts. Three parts for me. Oh. And we're just going to have to pay that away. Be careful that it won't burn your hands. Well, I have it on another towel because this is not. Okay. Well, let me lead the way for you. Thank you. All right, please follow us.
she was dead. We buried her immediately, and when we came back from the graveyard, two of my other children had already fallen ill, and by the following morning, they also had died. In the past two weeks, I have lost 10 of my 11 children. Yesterday, my oldest daughter, who had been married next month, passed away. This morning, my six-month-old baby also died. And we buried them together this morning. Now all I have left is my Maggie, and I am hoping and praying that she makes it because I cannot bear to lose all my children to this disease. It's too much. Well, she sounds better. Yeah, she is breathing just a little better now. Mm -hmm. Let's check her again. Let's see if her skin is up and mm -hmm. she her color is better. Yes, oh. her heart's coming. Oh, I oh. think the fever's coming. Yes, it has. It has. Yes. Oh, my baby. young lady here, she died of smallpox, and her family asked me to memorialize her. Often, this is a cheaper alternative, a much quicker and cheaper alternative than uh, portrait painting. What this allows is that we can pose the deceased with something of their, their favorite things, if you guys have noticed. Here I have some of my pieces, some of my uh, work from before. Now these, uh, these photos take about three minutes for them to expose slowly. So it's very important during the duration that you remain still. Another service I'd like to inform you of that I have is that upon the development of the photo, um, we can take it back into what is my Photoshop. And uh, to add a little bit more realistic feel to the photograph, we can add a little blush to the cheeks and paint that on, a little red or pink. And if the deceased eyes were closed, we can paint them so that they're open, so it's a little bit more realistic and lifelike. So, if you guys find yourself in need of my services ever, feel free to give me a call. Thank you very much. All right, if you will follow me. Now, if you will wait for me in the dining room at the bottom of your of the stairs, please turn to the left and go into the dining room and wait for me.
or your breath. So oftentimes you're buried alive. There is actually a manual in the 1800s that was called How to Survive Being Buried Alive. And one of the tips in that manual was to buy a bell when you were buried, your family bought you a bell, and put it on top of your grave. There would be a string leading from, your, from the bell down into your coffin which was tied to your finger or your arm or your leg in case you happen to come out of a trance or come alive and thresh around that then causing the bell to go off that's where the terms dead ringer and saved by the bell have worked so if you follow me My name is Timothy James. I was born May 13, 1864 and died January 20, 1876. Before I died, I was very sick with a fever for several weeks. Eventually, I lost my ability to talk and I could not be awakened. My skin became cold and clammy and they could, my parents could not find any heartbeat or breath and so I was pronounced dead. They prepared me for my burial. While they were preparing me, they noticed that my limbs were not as stiff as the corpse they should be. But after checking once again for breath and heartbeat and not finding any, I was buried. My burial caused a lot of talk throughout the neighborhood with many believing I was buried alive. My coffin was dug up three weeks later for internment into the family plot to county over. It was suggested that my coffin being wood be opened in order to see if, if it was in good enough condition without the need of a metallic casket to be hauled for 20 miles. The horror my poor family witnessed upon opening my casket was almost too much to utter aloud. You see, when I was buried, I was not dead, only in a sickness-induced trance, only to, awoke to, only to awake to discover my predicament. When they opened my coffin, my body was lying face downward, and I pulled out my hair. I tried desperately to scratch my way out of the, cough, of the sides and lid of my coffin, but could not. I lost many fingernails in the process. Eventually... I perished in the dirt and closed coffin. My body was once again buried, this time without knowing without a doubt. I was gone. My name is Lorraine Parth. I was 17 years old when I died in 1871 as the adopted daughter of Mrs. Moore Chu. Before my death, I was sick with cholera. I was left all alone as my mother had to flee to England due to attempts on her life. The surgeon who was in charge of my care during my illness was a wicked man who benefited from my death. He was also the man who attempted to kill my mother. He poisoned me and pronounced me dead, and no one was the wiser. I was then entombed in the Chu family vault. The wicked man put me in a pine coffin and nailed it shut. Ten years later, in 1881, my mother's brother died and the vault was unsealed to admit his body. When the undertaker's assistant entered the vault, he found the lid of my coffin on the floor. After my entombment, I had awoken from my drug-induced trance and realizing my situation, struggled violently to force open the lid of my coffin. I succeeded, however, after bursting forth from my casket, my casket, the strain of that effort caused me to faint straight away and I fell forward over the edge of my coffin and struck my head upon the masonry shelf, killing me instantly. My name is Margaret McCall. I was from Northern Ireland. One day I fell ill and was pronounced dead. After my wake, which was three days long, I was injured in the St. Hill graveyard. That night, my body was exhumed by grave robbers. The robbers tried desperately to remove a ring from my finger. They decided that they would have to cut my finger off to get to the ring. As they were cutting into my finger, I felt an intense pain which caused me to wake up, scaring away the would-be robbers.
I suppose I really should have thanked them for digging me out and waking me up. Any longer in my coffin would surely have been the end for me. I climbed up out of my coffin and proceeded to walk home. My family was gathered at our home grieving my burial when I knocked upon the door. I heard my poor grieving husband say to my children, If your mother were still alive, I'd swear that was her knock. Imagine his surprise when he opened the door to see me standing there in my burial clothes. He fainted straight away. Listen to ghost stories, you can go get concessions, or you can go and follow the path to where you began. Thank you.